beautiful morning for us to meet today around God's word. And Father, we thank you this morning. We approach your throne of grace with boldness because we know that we'll find mercy, grace, and love in abundance. And this morning, Lord, as we gather together, we gather as people of faith trusting you God that whatever our needs whatever our challenges you are the God that is able to come through for us and we want to pray and say speak your word to us Lord we are listening because we know that your word is power we know your, that your word brings life and therefore like Samuel we want to say speak Lord we are listening. In Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Let's, do, let's give them a hand as they take their seats. Thank you so much. Um, let me take this opportunity to welcome everybody. And you would know that because of the limited numbers we can all be here and so i want to take this opportunity to welcome everybody at home all the impactors that are watching from the impact channel and those of you who have joined us on facebook live we just want to welcome you and let me welcome everybody that is here and meeting here and i can tell you there's proper social distancing here if you are watching from afar and there's also an adherence to the number that is required. Friends, I really want to take this opportunity to thank God for the time that we have been spending together in this series. Uh, this is one of the most difficult series that one can do. And um, somebody, one pastor uh, asked me, it's not, it's not part of us, but he asked me, he, says, he said to me, yo, I can't believe you've taken such a difficult topic in such difficult moments. Uh, but he said to me, you are up to something in God. Because many people, including in our nation, many people are so offended, are so angry. That's why you see the things that you are seeing. And that was God's direction for you to take that line. And I can tell you, friends, time and again, as I prepared every part of the, uh, of the series whether it was part one or part two or part three, my wife can tell you. Sometimes I'll struggle on where to go and what to do. And I'll, I'll just go into my study and then sit there, just listening to God and just hear him. Uh, and sometimes some of the things will come at the last minute before I even record. And I'll hear God saying to me, this is the direction to go. And so it has been a difficult one, but very helpful. Very helpful. And I can tell you the reports that we're getting outside there. People have listened to this, uh, to this series and they are saying, Shush, thank God that you've gone there because I have been, I've been having a head for many years and I was not even aware that my life has been affected by that head from many years ago. And now through this series, I am able to go back and deal with that. And so this morning, I want to close the series. We are in part four of our series and our series is dealing with heads. I'm in part four and I'm closing it today. Remember when we started with this series, Jesus says to his disciples something that was very interesting. He says to them, as long as you live on this earth, you will be offended. You will, you will, have, you will have ample opportunities to be offended, but you will also offend others. Because you are, you, you are on this earth and that will happen. And um, you know... He, he goes on to say something and he was talking in Matthew 24 about the end times. And he says to see that the end times are here or are approaching or are upon us. He says, you'll see by many people being offended. 
Out of that offense, they will betray one another, but it will ultimately lead to people hating one another. And you're thinking Jesus is saying these things, they will never happen in the church because we are spirit-filled, but go in the church and see how many people hate each other in the church. And if the church cannot deal with that, there's no hope for the world. I can tell you now, there will be no hope for the world if the church can't deal with that. And sometimes I look at our county and I look at the violence and all of these things and I'm like, people are offended. They've been hurt for many years and they've never been able to sit down and deal with these things. And once we are not able to go there, friends, we are a nation in trouble. And so this morning, I really want us to go to Again, the text that I read in part 3, which is Psalm 119, verse 165. And I want to start there because it's key for me as we are going towards closing the series. It says, they have great peace, those who love your law, and nothing shall offend them. They have great peace, those who love your law or those who love your word. They have got great peace because nothing shall offend them. And last week I said to you, you know, it is very interesting to find people in the church so offended, but they claim to love God's word. <laughs> and the Bible says, if you love my word, if you love my word, it will be difficult for you to be offended. And that's why last week I said, our problem in the church is that we are preaching everything else except the word. We are preaching our, our opinions, we are preaching our ideas, we are preaching motivation and all of that. And I, I can tell you, my friends, motivation is important. I can tell you now, and I must say it, it is important. But it doesn't have the inherent power of changing people like God's word. Because the word of God, it's powerful powerful. It, it, it's able to change any situation. And that's why the psalmist says, you will have great peace when you love God's weight. What did he mean by that? And I gave you uh, three points. And I, I, and I wanted to give you five because the time was not on my side. And I was like, hey, I'm recording this thing. And I'm told and I'm looking at the watch. And I'm like, yo, time is not there. But I gave you a few things uh, from last week. And I and I said, number one, God's word will bring fruitfulness in our lives. Because if God's word is not in our lives, we don't become fruitful. The second thing that I said was, God's word will cause us to grow spiritually. That's why the word says, they have got great peace who love God's word. So when I have grown spiritually, offenses do not necessarily Get me out of the way. Because I am spiritually mature. That's why God's word is important. So you only get the peace of God that surpasses all understanding in your life. And you grow powerfully when you stay in his word, not in other things. And number three, I said to you, the word of God will bring success in your life. And I read Joshua 1.8 which says, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe to do according to what is written in it. And listen to the next verse. And it says, For then you will know how to be prosperous. Ah, you will prosper and then you will have good success. So when we have got the word of God in our lives, we become successful, we become prosperous. And that's why last week I said, could it be that an offense has taken away prosperity in your life because your, the word of God is not speaking to your offense? And when I talk about prosperity, I'm not talking about this wishy-washy gospel of prosperity is only money. Money is one of them, but it's not the key thing. 
When I, when I have got good health, my friends, I am prosperous. When I've got peace with my wife, I am prosperous. When we can live in harmony in my family with my children, we are prosperous. Not this thing that you are prosperous when your money is waiting for you. When you go out, a man of God, the money will just fall on you. And then all of, all of a sudden, we see God as an ATM that must just give us money. Then we are prosperous. That gospel is very dangerous. And I'm not saying money will not answer all. Because the Bible says that. But I can tell you, silver and gold are mine, says the Lord. So you start with God and silver and gold will follow Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I seek money and seek these things. It, the kingdom of God. And these monies and all of these things will follow us. Right now we are chasing these things and we get offended in our chasing of these things. Number four, which I didn't say last week because of time. And I just felt somebody phoned me immediately after that. Just, but you said you are going to give us five points. You gave us three. No, I can tell you. Hey, I got a phone quickly. And I had to apologize. But I said to the person, don't worry. It is because I was looking at the time. Because as I'm preaching there, I'm looking at the time and I'm like, yo, the media guys in the church will kill me because people are using their data. And you must be very, 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 very considerate. That not everybody has much data as you. So I had to cut it there because others will not hear them. So today they've got an opportunity to hear them. Number four and number five. <laughs> number four the word of God brings purpose in our lives you know when we are offended we lose our focus because the Bible is very clear it says fixing our eyes on Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith but when you are offended your eyes move away from Jesus and it goes to the offender you sleep, you see the offender. You eat, you see the offender even in your food. You walk around, you see the offender. You see them coming this way, you want to change in the mall. Have you ever met the person that has offended you in the mall? They see you from a distance and they just change the direction. Because your focus has moved away from Christ. Your focus is on an offense and I can tell you, the devil uses offenses as a bait. He hooks us on offenses. In actual fact, this is what the devil does. If he wants to remove you from the purpose of your life, he brings an offense, an offense gets into your heart, and it destroys every single word of God and every promise that God said to you. You forget about them, and then you start losing focus. And your purpose is gone. Child of God, wherever you are, whether you are watching me on Facebook or whether you are watching me on our channel, let me tell you, my friend, if you want to have God's purpose back in your life, deal with your offense. Make sure that God's word is deeper and rooted and grow in God. So that even those who, see, who want to believe that you are their, their enemies, they may watch you Eating on the table of the Lord that is prepared before you. You can't go there when you still carry them in your heart. <laughs> the word of God will bring purpose in our lives. Number five. Remember, I'm just finishing last week and then I want to I wanna come to today. Because today I want to close this topic. Number five. The word of God gives us guidance and direction. Hey, hey, hey. It guides us. You're not guided by what people are saying. You're not guided by their anger and their hatred for you. You are guided by God's word. And sometimes even, I know that people are watching me on social media. I know that sometimes people go on social media and on Facebook because they want to boast about the things that they're doing so that they can show their enemies. You have lost the plot. It's not about them. <laughs> Don't even go on social media because you want to show them. You have lost the plot. Because God's word must guide us and it must give us direction. If you read 
Um, Psalm 119, 105, it says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Your word, not, nothing else but your word. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. So when, when you have got God's word in your life, you are guided by God's word. You are not guided by the gossips and what people are saying about you. You know, I can tell you now, this morning, that if I was the sum total of what people said about me, I should be dead by now. <laughs> when I should be dead, if I'm still alive, I should be amounting to nothing because of what people say. But because I'm not guided by them, and I'm not guided by their, their, their sayings out there. I'm guided by God's word. Babunyat is here. The old man is here. I've worked with that old man for many years. For, for many years. Whoever thought or one day I'll be standing here preaching in the church that he started. <laughs> when God directs you, my friends, I can tell you. All things work together. For what? For the good of those who love him. People might have written you off. But if you are guided by God's word. And you are not holding on offenses. God will prosper you in their eyes. Because you are directed by his word. That was point number five from last week. So this week. Part number four. We are closing it. In part number four, there's a beautiful story in 2 Kings 5. It's a beautiful story in 2 Kings 5. And I'm going to read from verse 4 to 6, 9 to 16. And it reads as follows, if you have got it, and I'm reading it from the NIV version of the Bible. It says, Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go. The king of Aram replied, I'll send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 of shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. Verse 9. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elijah's house. Elijah sent a messenger to him and said, Go and wash yourself seven times in the river of Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry. Now I wanted to underline that. <laughs> Naaman is told, but he becomes offended. He becomes angry that he is told to go and wash. I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the Lord, on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over me, and the spot and kill me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Fapa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Naaman asked. Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in rage. In verse 11, he was angry and offended. In verse 12, towards the end, he left in rage. Eh? Verse 13, Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down, dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored. And became clean. Like that of a young boy. 
Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please, accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept anything. Hey, 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 Elijah, what buys am I? Anka bilwa prophet, I'm going to tell you about 7,000 before you come and see me. Before you come and see me, what? 7,000. And this man is healed, and he's trying to give the, 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 the prophet of God a gift, and he says, I, I know, I will not accept anything. And even though Naaman urged him, Elijah refused. Now, you see, Friends, what we are reading here, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting story. Naaman was a very strong commander of the Syrian army. Very strong one. In actual fact, the king trusted him so much. King Aram trusted Naaman so much, powerfully so, because the guy was good. But there was a little problem with him. He had leprosy. He had leprosy. And that was, that was a concern. And you would know that in those days, if you had leprosy, you must go out there and die there alone. And the king was concerned because this guy, it's a powerful commander. Have you ever thought about how powerful you were when you did not have any offenses? I'll come back to that. Just want to touch something in because I want to throw these things so that you catch them. Because it is important for us to catch these things. So Naaman's wife had a little girl from Israel who was a slave who was working for her in the house. This little girl came to the mistress and said, Shoo, you know that if my, if, if my master, is talking about Na uh, Na Naaman, if my master can go to Israel, there's a prophet there who can kill, I mean cure him, who can cure him of his leprosy. And the wife told the husband, the wife said, hey, this little girl is telling me about something here. And this little girl comes from Israel and they are, a, they are slaves here. A slave girl comes to help a man that is the commander of the army of King Aram. And you can tell that even in your slavery, God can use you. <laughs> when you think I am enslaved, God says, you are the perfect agent for my word. So then Naaman listened to that and Naaman went to the king and said, King, you know what? This girl is telling me that there's a prophet in Israel who can, who can cure me, who can heal me from this thing. And the king says, no problem. I'm even giving you a letter so that you are allowed to go there. Naaman goes there, arrives there, and then he went to Elijah's house and this something happens. And this thing is very disturbing for him. So he arrives at that house and he's hoping that the prophet of God will come out and, and, and we read it in, and, and these are not my words. They are in the Bible. The prophet of God will come out and stretch his hand on me. <laughs> you see now these people love <laughs> this thing. <laughs> and the Bible says, be hasty to lay hands. Eh? And of course I know James chapter 5 says, if anyone is sick among you, let him call the elders of the church. Let them put their hands on them. A Prayer, not the hands, a prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. Rena, sometimes we put emphasis on things that the scriptures are not putting emphasis on. <laughs> so this guy is thinking, no, this guy must come out. The prophet must touch me. The prophet must lay his hand on me. And the prophet doesn't do that. He doesn't even come out. <laughs> doesn't even come out. You, you see, that is a setting for an offense there. Perfect setting for an offense. Prophet doesn't come out. The worst part, one, he doesn't come out. Two, he's not going to lay hands on this guy. Three, he sends a servant to, a servant to go and talk to him. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. <laughs> I know I went to the man of God uh, uh, in Pretoria. <laughs> and, and then I paid 7,000 and he didn't even see me. <laughs> you learn the hard way, yeah? <laughs> 
<laughs> the power belongs to God, not to a human being. It is in God, not in a human being. We need to test this God without these things out for reality. And I did that, especially when I'm Africa. Ratan thought out for a man. We must have faith in this God. Trust Him. So the servant goes out and he meets Naaman and he says, hey, hey, my master sent me to tell you something. This guy is, yo, 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 yo. <laughs> Sorry. And the, and, and the servant went and told him to wash himself seven times in the Jordan River. But Naaman was angry. <laughs> angry. And he went away in rage. Offense comes in. He is offended because the man of God did not come out. Have we realized that many of us here are offended at God because the man of God has disappointed us? <laughs> some, of, some of the people today, they no longer want church because they've been offended by the man of God. They forget that there's a God in heaven. Who loves them. And that God does not require the man of God to speak on their behalf. We have got access to the Father. Bona, that veil has been torn. We are the priesthood of all believers. We can access the throne of grace with boldness. No, the man of God did not come and I'm offended. My friend, you are offended by the wrong thing. That man does not even have the power that you think he has. The power comes from God. We are just vessels. And I must say that. Sometimes I listen to people and I look at them and I, I worry a lot because they've replaced Jesus and they've put themselves as Jesus. And when people are offended at them, they want to come and castigate them on their pulpits. You are not God. Allow people to go to the God that they serve. Don't make yourself a God. And this man takes an offense. And in, in, in his offense, this is, this is what happens in his offense. He is, he is enraged. He's angry. And then he says, guys, he says to his servants, guys, let's go back. And they went back. Took everything, they went back. It says one of the servants, one of the servants, the servants of Naaman, one of them says, my master, can I just have a word with you? Just a word. Master, imagine if the prophet of God had said to you through his servant, said to you, go and do something great. Wouldn't you have gone there and do it? A hey, Naaman just thought, hey, yeah, no, but you're talking. And he says, but why are you offended by a simple thing of just throwing yourself in that river and come out healed? <laughs> a servant. You know, sometimes people that are offended, you, you just need servants, little people who like can come to you and say, what has offended? Why are you so angry? Ujaki, <laughs> No, the thing Kurko Kirkinella Salabang offender can 19 Baba Babo. Look today. When I just need a servant to come to you and say, Ukajaki, just to go. And this is where my, 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 the crux of my, met, uh, my, my message today is. Processing our offenses so that we can be healed. Processing our offenses so that we can be healed. So the servant talks to him, and then Naaman processes the offense, and he thinks, but this servant is right. In the multitude of counsel, there's wisdom. Listens to that, and they turn back. They turn, they turn back, and then Naaman went to the river Jordan. He arrives there, he dips himself seven times as he was told. Remember, the prophet is not there. The prophet is not touching him. Nothing is happening. All what he did, he processed his offense by listening to advice. Maybe you need other people to talk to you. Why are you still offended even today? I can tell you. I mean, I'll, I'll keep on giving an example with the old man Mudala here. He had opportunities to be offended. There's a guy that he helped and he served. And the guy said stuff about Mdala and did all of these things. But the old man, 
And I'm, and I'm not buying his face because I know the story I was with him. But the old man kept on being there for that guy. And of course, I can tell you the guy did not succeed in so many ways. With the church in Zanspreit at that time. And these places were not here at that time. Nothing. And the old man kept on going to that young man. And walked with him even if that guy was offended. I love the spirit because... Even if a person is offended, keep on going to them and show them the right way. One day, they may be able to see that my offense is killing me. I need to process it properly. Naaman processed it and listen to that. Listen to this, my friends, and I want you to hear this properly. If Naaman did not process his offense, he would have gone back in anger and arrived home still leprous and die with leprosy. Because he would not have listened. The reason why that thing is killing you is taking away your joy. You are not even coming to church anymore. You are not even going to your church wherever you belong. You are not going there anymore because Abba Zalwani, they've offended you. But let me tell you what is happening. When you are dying slowly but surely because of the leprosy of an offense. Go back. You know, when you keep an offense, it's like this. It's like drinking poison and hoping that it will kill the person that has offended you. <laughs> because an offense eats you. It destroys you. But now they are going on with their life. When I hear you are keeping them in your heart. You are carrying them here everywhere where you go. When people see you, no, I've been offended. No, I'm offended. <laughs> I'm offended. Drop this thing. Drop it and move forward. Once you drop it, it has got no power to destroy you. Naaman listens to advice and went back, dipped himself seven times, and he came out. And then guess what happens? And then after that, they went back to the man of God. Hey, hey, now I can see that you are a man of God. And now I can see that there's no other God than the God of Israel. Hallelujah. It's a little 10,000. The man of God said, it's got nothing to do with me. You're here. Bansa for Dodge. Buffet said, Betty Takaros Kakabu, a comrade. But I'm freely have been given. Freely give. That's why it is important for, for you to check. Hemutarko and Ara, how about a matamudimu, Kikopon for ten thousand? You must know there's no God in that thing. You must, you must actually know. So he goes back home. He's healed. Then he wanted to give the man of God something. And the man of God that says, ah, don't worry. It's not about that. Three points and then I'm done for today. Because that's where I'm closing it. How do you process the offense? How do you do it? And I can tell you, friends, many people want to forgive, but they don't know how. They don't, they don't, even, they don't even have the slightest clue on how to forgive. Point number one, if you are writing... Do it the way God told you to do it. That's number one. Point number one. If you're going to process your offense properly, do it the way God told you to do it. If you can take my mic down a bit, I can tell that it's, uh, it's too loud. Matthew 18, 15 to 17 says, If your fellow believer sins against you, you must go to that one privately, and I'm reading it from the TPT translation. If your fellow believer sins against you, you must go to that one. I love TPT. That one. Privately. <laughs> and attempt to resolve the matter. If he responds, your relationship is restored. <laughs> Listen to that verse. If somebody has offended you, Bazalwan, it says, go to that one. That, Bazalwan, it says one. That one. 
I had to go to everybody. Because Abba Zalon, when they are offended in the church or where, they go and find others who are offended like them. Yeah, this is what they did to me. This is, no, 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 that one. Remember, point number one is, do it the way God said you must do it. Go to that one. Number two, it says, privately. So let me do the little ten and come on. Come on, little 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 because they didn't go to that one. They went to everybody. And then everybody, if they have not grown spiritually, they catch your offense, and then they walk in the offense that has got nothing to do with them. And that's why we have got a problem. And the Bible says, go to that one privately and deal with the matter. That's how God wants us to, do, to deal with it. But if his heart is closed, then go to him again, taking one or two others, so that you can fulfill the scriptures that teaches us that every word may be verified by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So how pala nka omwe leba bedili ekwa na hape that one, not to us, that one privately, others to that one again. Matthew 6, 12. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Hey, hey, hey. So you go to that one. When they confess, it says you have won them and you have restored the relationship. But you see, Jesus says something in Matthew 6 and that is very interesting for me. He says, if, if you want your sins to be forgiven, forgive others. But this is how he says it. He says, Lord, we are praying that you forgive our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. This is how God wants us to do it. He wants us to forgive others as he forgave us. And this is where I come in and say forgiveness is the most difficult thing. I, let me tell you, it's the most difficult thing. I can tell you, my friends. I've been born again for 39 years. I've had an opportunity to lead in different churches. Including two white churches. I had an, an opportunity to lead in different churches. And I can tell you, my, my friends, there have been people that have hurt us as a couple, as a family, where you felt like you don't want to forgive them. <laughs> and God says, nah, 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 nah. How are you going to lead if you can't forgive? And God doesn't expect us to forgive as we want. He says, as I have forgiven you. Lena, you think forgiveness is the, is the simplest thing? It's not. It's difficult. Forgiveness is difficult. You know what is the simplest thing to do? Is to keep a grudge. <laughs> that is simple. Keep a grudge. I'm not going to talk to them. I'm not going to bamba Sanders. I can't have hurt me. I'm, I'm not bambing. Lord, please help me. I'm bambing every Bazalwani here except for this one. Because it is easy to hold a grudge. Forgiveness is difficult. That's why God wants us to do it in his own way. If you are going to deal with your offenses, do it the God way, not your own way. Because your own way is the easiest way to your death. <laughs> because if you keep the head, it will kill you one day because it's poisonous. Listen to Matthew 6.15. It says, but if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive you your sins. Hey, this is what this one it becomes more difficult for me. You know, this is the attitude that God takes. He says, if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive you your sins. And imagine, if God is against you, who will help you? <laughs> no one. That's why forgiveness is difficult. And this is what many people say to me. How much of forgiveness do they deserve? How much of that forgiveness do they deserve? 
And Jesus comes and says, 70 times? Seven. In, 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 a, in a what? In a day. Ah, then, then you realize I'm hopeless. I'm hopeless. But this is, this is, I don't want you to ask this question that how much of forgiveness they deserve. I want you to ask this one. How much of freedom do I desire? How much of freedom do I desire? Because if I don't forgive them, I am held in captivity. But if I forgive them, the desire for freedom in my life says I forgive them as the Father has forgiven me. Therefore, I am free. Ay, ay, ay. So now, point number one, do it as God says. Because if you're going to do it in your own way, you can't do it. It's impossible. And I can tell you, I've, I've, I've seen that. It has happened even in my life. And today, I live free from offenses. I can tell you now. I live free from offenses. And people try to do all sorts of things to try to get me offended. And they realize that I don't get that space. I don't get into that space. I actually move on. And I forgive them. And I pray for them. One of the things that I pray for them is that God bless them. I do. I want God to bless them. I want God to prosper them. One of the blessings that God can give them is for the revelation of the head that they've caused. <laughs> because I'm praying for them, okay? When you're thinking, no, and, and when you are supposed to pray for the person that has hurt you, it is it's the most difficult. God, bring fire! They call them dangerous prayers. Obliterate them, kill them, finish them. I know I'm praying for my enemies. <laughs> Deal with them harshly. No. <laughs> no. Do it as God would want you to do it. And it is difficult. Do it that way. Bless them, Lord. I pray that they will be successful in, in whatever that they do. And I do. I pray for people. Some of the people may not know that I'm praying for them. They're thinking, yeah, he's God. And think, I... I I've lived in this gospel and in the church. And if you want to know how you can be hurt, get into church. West, lead Abba Zalwad. And if you don't know that sheep bite, ask us who have led churches. So I had to learn through that, that no matter what, I must love people no matter what. Even when you meet them and they don't want to greet you, greet them. Somebody's asking a question and I can hear it. In, in their minds. Does it mean I must forget? <laughs> Does it mean I must forget what they did to me? Now forgiveness is not equal to forgetting. Forgive, forgiveness is something different. Only God has got the ability to forget. Tina is human beings. You may not forget what they've done to you. But you may, you may live in the freedom of having forgiven them. Hey, I want you to hear that again. God is the only one who's got the ability to forget. Tonight as human beings, we are limited. When you meet the person or when you see a scar, it will remind you of what happened. Emotional scars, the divorce. When you see that guy, you remember what he did to you. But the forgiveness that you have meted out to them helps you to live in freedom even if you remember what they did. So I've answered your question. I'm not asking you to, 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 not to remember and then to forget. Nah, I'm asking you to forgive. And when you're forgiven, you love them nonetheless. Because you no longer look, them, I mean, look at them through their offense. You look at them through their forgiveness that they don't deserve. <laughs> because God wants you to do it that way. Point number two. How are we going to process these offenses? Point number two. Forgiveness is unfair. Hey, Abba Zalani, what? Yeah, Mfunis. I told you that forgiveness is difficult. Keeping an offense is easy, but forgiveness is difficult. So, point number two: How to process your offense? You must know that forgiveness is difficult, and it's unfair. Very unfair. Forgiveness is very, very unfair. What do I mean by that? Psalm 103, verse 10 to 11. It reads as follows. 
God does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. <laughs> yo, yo, listen to that. God does not treat you and me as our sins deserve. Hey, hey, hey. Let me tell you what it means in simple, in simple terms and in simple language. Dibitaruna, they are so worse that they deserve punishment. But God, in his forgiveness, he becomes unfair on himself for the fairness of us. Hey, hey, hey. Right, listen to that again. We deserve to die and to be punished for our sins. And the Bible says, God does not punish us as our sins deserve. He doesn't do that. That is unfair. <laughs> that is unfair. It's unfair of God not to punish us for our sins. But he does it. <laughs> no, no, Muruti. It's unfair to expect me to forgive them what they did to me. You don't know what they did. <laughs> Come back. Come back. Forgiveness. It's unfair. <laughs> because Jesus says, simple, when you pray, pray like that. Our Father, forgive us our sins. As we do what? Forgive those who? And when it comes to second part, it's unfair. <laughs> I can't want God to, for, to forgive us. So God forgives me my sins and it's unfair on God to forgive me my sins, but he does it. But the second part, it's unfair on me to forgive the, the one who offended me. But God says, do it as I did it. That's how forgiveness is unfair. You must know it's unfair because Jesus went to the cross and carried your sin and my sin unfairly so that we should have been punished for our sins. But he took it on our behalf. Forgiveness is unfair. But we must do it as God did it. Why? The unfairness of this thing on God taking our sins instead of us taking our own sins show that God is a just God. He's full of justice. He's a just God. Let me tell you what this will do. If you keep grudges, they'll keep on exhausting you and that becomes even more unfair on your life. If you want revenge, it will always self-destruct because you are destroying yourself when others are living their lives. Three, if you live in unforgiveness, the wound will always be opened when there is an opportunity to be hurt. That's why forgiveness is unfair, but it's just. It's unfair, but it's just. So if you're going to deal with your offense, you must know it's not the easiest thing. It's unfair, but it's what God wants us to do. Because it was unfair for Jesus to carry your sins and to carry my sin on the cross. And he comes back and says, as I did, do. Number three. And I'm closing with it. Once you have done number one and number two, number three is key and I want to cement that. Create healthy boundaries with people. And this one, this one, this one I can take I can take the whole month talking about creating bound, healthy boundaries. I had, I had bad boundaries. I had bad ones. One day we'll talk about that. I didn't know how to set boundaries. And that's why the offenses kept on coming and kept on repeating themselves. Because I didn't have healthy boundaries until I knew how God taught me to do that. Boundaries are a way to take care of ourselves. And how do we create those boundaries? Let me read a text first. I mean two or three texts first before I can give you the points. And then we are closing. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 16, it says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Listen to how it says. It says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Uh, here I'm going to get into trouble with what I'm going to say. But I'm going to say it. And I know I'm going to get into trouble. 
The reason why I'm already know, I mean, I already know that I'm going to get into trouble is because people want to be faithful to ideas and perspectives rather than God's word. And I mean, I've made it my point. I want to stick to God's word and I want to be faithful to it. Whether I have one or two people around me, I don't care. As long as we are in God's word, I'm okay. Because God's word will give us life. So the, this text says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? So this is one of the things that I want you to think about as a boundary. You've got young ladies or young boys in the church who have accepted Christ and they're living okay. And one day, they don't, because I guess they haven't created boundaries in terms of God's way. One day they want to get married. Ne? One day they want to get married. And then they decide, or uno let Why a fella let the kiss? And and I can tell you, many of you. That's why I'm saying uh, it's going to get me in trouble. But I must say it. When you get married, you want to get married to a person that, when you have got issues, you can approach the same God. You can pray together. You've got the same beliefs. Because I can tell you, whether you are in God or not, if you don't have the same beliefs, I can tell you, you're going to destroy yourselves and you're going to destroy that marriage. And that's why the world says, no, the concept of marriage is outdated. It's no longer there. Born a marriage. My friend, I can tell you, this is the bedrock of every community. If marriages are destroyed, you are sure the society and the community and the nation will be destroyed. So you go for Khobakis. Utale Khobakis. Well, no, the thing is, you, you guys don't understand. I love, I love, I love him. He makes my world go. <laughs> and I can tell you, Utale Bowen al Faslahao. Little oil like this. When I just get married and, and live with little oil like this, even worse. The day you say, let's pray, are... <laughs> pray what? You knew I don't believe in that nonsense of yours. Because you've married somebody who does not share in your faith. Because you have never put a proper boundary there. You were led by your emotions. Remember last uh, uh, session number two? I said your emotions are not always reliable. <laughs> They're not always reliable. So when you feel here, yeah, and, and especially if God's word leads your life, make sure that there's a boundary in your life in terms of who marries you. Hey, hey, hey. And uh, now I'm already in trouble. Because someone will tell you that and a bibli earring, no one is. All, Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. We need God in our lives. And so we're not looking. And I already, now when you say that, I already, I can already tell that you are listening to your emotions and you are not listening to God because you are, you are attracted and your attractions sometimes when they don't have proper boundaries, they will let you astray. That's why how we can, hey, Muruti, ya kupale, kupale, tele, nrapele, liti, mona, lela, litu, hile, kako, hai. Liti, mona, lela, li, enteng, litu, hile. And none that you to Mara Madam Dinam Sukeli Sukeli is such a Unga shat in a little moon. I'm going to do that today. Go on, one or kill All along, Uluki today, the mona la little he like a high. And Ronald will win you from from Qua and not open a culture these days. Yeah, 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 these days. And especially amongst black people, I must say that. That's why I'm saying these things will get me into trouble. Especially among black people. We don't know how to hold each other accountable. We don't. In actual fact, the best thing we can do is to destroy one another. 
If, 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 the, if there's anything that we do well, it's to destroy each other. But to hold one another accountable, we don't even know. In the church, it's worse. We talk about, no, no, no. Even about telling the language of, of the world. But no, but we serve a God of love. Yeah, you must just show love everywhere. Love, love. And so we must love you to hell. Even when we are going to hell. And we must not tell you that that thing is going to kill you. No, just love me. Now, one of this time, there is, I, 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 I told you so, loving me. We, we love you. I, that I can tell you, we love you. We love you so much that we will not stop telling you when you are going into the fire. <laughs> and we must come to that place as black people to be able to hold one another accountable. There are a number of guys who have killed and destroyed churches out there. We can't tell them because we are afraid. We can't tell each other the truth. And these conversations are around there. We know they are, they are all over. Black people, they... are <laughs> some of us. We destroy them. So, this Khwabaki's this guy, you don't have proper boundaries. And one day, they will offend you and make you angry and destroy your life and you'll come back and hate church and say, Bazalona has been supported when the Khwabaki was destroying me. You forgot or when we told you you don't love me. One Corinthians five thirty three. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupt good character. Yeah, 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 yeah. These things are in the Bible. When are you keep walking with people that are destroying your character and they're bad company, but you want to keep them? One day when they when they hurt you badly, what next are they? Next time, I will They used me. Bang seven the seed. The love and love. Nam shanja angba fool. Ah ah. You did not have healthy boundaries from the beginning. What are those healthy boundaries? Let me give you. I've got seventeen of them. I'm just going to give you five or six, and then I'm done. Number one. These people constantly gossip about others and in your midst and you support them. These people constantly gossip about others in your midst and you support them. Once that happens, you must know you don't have a healthy boundary. Because tomorrow, they will gossip about you and it will hurt worse. Because it will offend you more than it offended others when you were gossiping about them. So put a boundary. How do you put a boundary on that one? When people start gossiping about people, shut them up. Or move away from them. That's a powerful boundary. You're no longer my friend. Cut them out. Because when I skip waste, where people will always come and say negative things about people, you accept them. Tomorrow when they say negative things about you, you are so hurt, you don't even want to come to church anymore. You were gossiping with them. Put a boundary on gossipers. Let them not use you. Let them not misuse you. Number two, where to put a boundary. These people take advantage of your goodness. They take, they always take the advantage of your goodness. No, we know. Ah, it doesn't matter. No. Remove the abusers in your life. Because if you don't put boundaries on that, they will destroy you. You have helped them. You have fed them. Tomorrow they backstep you. And then you keep on doing the same thing again and again and again. You don't have healthy boundaries. Put a boundary on that thing. Never allow anybody to abuse you. Your goodness for the sake of the gospel. That is a manipulation. And there, I must, I must confess, I didn't have a good boundary there. I had to work on it. Because naturally, I'm a giver. And it, it, it comes naturally. I mean, it's like... I, it's just like, but I had, to, I had to learn on how to do that so that people don't use that side of me, of my kindness, and then destroy everything that God has done. 
Number three. These people are frequently angry and aggressive. There's nothing. Every time when they talk to you, they are angry about church. They are angry about other people. They are angry about everything. And Luana, you are taken by their anger. They are angry against me simply because I'm preaching about offenses. Because somebody told them, no, preacher can I can't the word of God had to change me first. So Alison changed the The word of God is meant for people to change, not donkeys and cows. So I can go and yeah, I'm offended because my book can now I can level who are who are offense camera how deal alone. I'm happy in Chula Mimu Fitate. Because I know. I mean, despite so many testimonies that we, 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 we hear from other people. I mean, three pastors already want me to come in their churches and talk about this topic. Already. But I know, one of them said to me, openly, he said, He told me that. And I said, Lena, I know, I'm, I'm trading on that. But I don't care because this time God said to me, I want you to do that because I want my people to be free. From here, I want them to be free from offenses so that they can honor me, so that they can be progressive, so that they can be prosperous, so that everything of them can be as God intended them to be. <laughs> so remove those kind of people who are constantly angry. Number four, these people, where you, want to, where you need to put boundaries... They always blame others and they never take responsibility for their actions. Put boundaries with this kind of people. They always blame others and they never take responsibility for their own actions. Never. Not even once. No. <laughs> they always, they, they always do that. Where I work, They've actually, my office, it's, they've even changed that into a counseling. Because even my colleagues, they come there. It's like I talk to them. And, and it's like God has helped me to walk this thing for many years to a point where I can, I can, I can help colleagues who don't talk to each other. Because I have learned on how to deal with offenses. And so I can tell you, you can do whatever you can do. You're not going to offend me. There are two things I'm going to do. If I can't treat you as a brother and that I love, I'll treat you as an enemy that I love, I pray for, and I, I support. <laughs> because the scriptures are saying that to me. So wh what must I do? I'll, I'll continue with life. You'll watch me and say, Mara, warera, mara, kikwatila. Ah, deal with your offense. Now I'll keep on preaching. I can use my job. <laughs> hey, Medal. Medal. <laughs> No, but I've got confidence because the old man, like I'm saying, I'm, I'm, and I'm not buying his face, he can tell you, we worked together a long time before these others, others that can come here. The last one. This kind of people where you need to put boundaries, they've got a lot of drama in their lives. They always come and dump their problems on you and they don't change. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> They've got a lot of drama in their lives. They always have problems and they don't want to change. <laughs> have you ever seen that person? Liberty but manipulate again this kind of people. Yeah, can you put a problem? Because you don't want to change. And I know that people who left church because you know, and to be honest, my wife is here. He's my witness. I pray, for, I pray for this church and I pray for people. And I may not necessarily come and tell you, but I do. Almost every morning, I mean, our elders know that I know their, their, their children's names. I pray for their children's names. Every mo it's, a, it's a morning thing. I start there. That's what I do. And I know if I don't pray for this church, I should not be leading this church. I shouldn't. So whether I like it or not, when I wake up, the duty I have is to pray for you. Even if I don't know you by name, I say, all the people, the impactors that I'm leading, that you have given me an opportunity to lead them, God, whatever they are going through, I pray today that you'll give them grace. You'll give them breakthrough. And I do it. 
And sometimes it may, it may, it may sound like, okay, yeah, broken record is in, in each one. But I do it every day. Three things that I always do in the morning. One, I tell God and I say, God, this is a new day and I want, to, I want them to rejoice in it. Number two, I say, God, wherever they are, I know they need your protection. I just pray for protection over them. Number three, these three things. Number three, I say, I want you to provide for them, for their needs. Because all of us have got needs every day of our lives. And when you, you arrive come miracle, and then how complain? So I can't phone, I can't check. Can I pray that you don't lose your job? And you don't know it. Because I'm I can tell you let's get a mocker can kin a little one. Ah now I know my job. And I can tell you in our team, we are not so gifted pastorally, unlike me. They are more gifted like pastoral, like Bodombo, Boransolase. Those guys, they are very gifted pastoral. They can come to you, but no, okay, but they say this over and they check. Okay, they are very little check. Oh, it's all, yeah, hey, Boransolase, what about? What's that? What's that? What's that? That's why he's here, he can tell you. There are these friends of ours that they keep on giving us food or pastors or other things. These white guys, I've worked with them. I was, I was an elder in their church. And so they decided they want to keep that relationship with me. So most of the things, they're different. But, but if I never know, hey, Renale, these things, or Renale, Dijon, Renale, Kubo, Renale, all of these things, I don't go and distribute with them. I, this, this is the guy. He's here. He can, if, if I'm lying, he can come and tell you. He's here. He takes his van or run to last. They go and fetch those things, and then they go and distribute it. You never even know who it is. <laughs> Why? Because it's, it's unimportant. It's not important for me for you to know the relationships that I have. It's not important. But those who are pastoral, they can take them and continue <laughs> That's why you need to deal with your offenses. Because if you have got all these dramas, you will never know these things. Put boundaries. I link out and I want us to pray. Put boundaries. This is what I want us to pray because we're closing this uh, session. And Jesus in Luke chapter, chapter 17, he says to his disciples, forgive them. 70 times 7. And this is how the disciples answers. The disciples said to Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> We don't know how to do this thing. We need you to increase our faith. And this is how I want us to pray. After all this heavy series, I want us to come to a place where we're saying, Lord, please increase our faith. We, we fail in this thing and we need you to increase our faith to do it properly. Otherwise, if we don't have that faith, we can't do it. I know it. I've struggled for, for, for years until I got it right. And I said, Lord, increase my faith. And my faith was increased. So I'm able to forgive people. And I no longer live in offense at all. At all. I, that I can tell you. Will people rub me on the wrong side every day? I've got that opportunity to be rubbed. But because the Lord has increased my faith, I live free from that offense. Mudal, can you come and pray for us, please? Uh, where is this prayer? Shall we pray? Thank you. Dear beloved Father, thank you so much this morning for the message that talks to us where we have to draw our boundaries and be fair and open and discard what is not right. Even if our relationships are not right, it's painful, Lord. We cannot afford it. But in Jesus' name, we want to humble ourselves and accept this message that we should repent and did like Naaman did, obeyed, and went to the river and to wash himself. We need washing. We need cleansing. We need renewal. 
take us, Lord. Teach us to be humble and honest with one another. Lord Jesus, thank you that you paid for our sins and made us free. We pray for the weak and we pray for the leaders of the church to stand and not buy faces of people but to say, this is what my mission is. We ask all this, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Yes, a very difficult and tough series indeed. But uh, all I can say, let him who has ears hear what the Spirit has said. Unfairness as forgiveness is, let us learn. Go before God. Ask God to give us the strength and the enablement to be able to forgive so that we can be free and be released. Because the word of God says, him whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And for you to be able to forgive, you will indeed be free. Amen. Amen.